Major summit going on at the Vatican as the Pope and top cardinals try to deal with the sex abuse crisis, one that's rocked the church for years. From Australia to North America, Europe to South America, pedophile and predatory priests targeting children. You get the sense that the church has never really understood how serious this story is, or only now starting to realize, and that all the damage, of course, it has done to the Catholic Church, the Catholic brand, so to speak, and that's somehow been lost up until now. Perhaps they are too detached at the Vatican, or too trapped in their religious rules and formality, up too out of touch or arrogant to understand that these acts were criminal, are criminal, at the church was, and perhaps even still is, protecting criminals in their midst. Something might come out of this summit, or maybe not. It could be just a big PR exercise, or there could be some concrete results as well. We're going to have to see. At the same time, a bombshell book is out by French author Frédéric Martel, who spent four years on his research inside of the Vatican. He was interviewing dozens of top officials and insiders. He uncovered what he calls a huge gay subculture that gay men basically run the church, according to him, which at first glance seems kind of astonishing. He says a majority of those priests and bishops are closeted gay men, and it's almost an open secret, at least to those who are actually sort of in the know. My guest on the line in St. Paul, Minnesota, is Chris Damien. He's a writer, he's a speaker, he's a lawyer. He has written on the issue of clergy abuse. Uh, he's also the writer of two different books on what it means to be gay and Catholic. Chris, wonderful to have you on the program. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. So we've got these two stories, and we're trying to make sense of them. Let me let me start with the summit on abuse. And we want to be very careful. We are not confusing one with the other. There is a lot of research out there. There is no link whatsoever between priests and their sexual orientation and any sort of abuse of children or minors. Let me start with the summit. Do you think we're going to see anything concrete come out of this? Uh, I mean, I do think that there will be concrete recommendations. Uh, The big question that I would have kind of at a local level is how they're going to be implemented in each diocese. You know, I mean, so there could be recommendations for the global church, but a lot of it will depend on what the bishops take back home with them. Yeah, it's a great point, Chris. And I think what you're saying is one thing to have rules on the books. It's another thing to actually enforce them in practice. And this is certainly a criticism that the Catholic Church has come under in recent years, that they say one thing, but in practice they're not doing the other. Do you think the church doesn't get it, like that they are just so detached and and sort of out of touch with with the real world, so to speak? I mean, is there anything to be said for that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a very complex problem and it's a complex issue. I think that a big part of not getting it is failing to really recognize the scope and the magnitude of what's been going on within within our chancelleries, even. Uh, Again, you know, I think back to the Twin Cities. We had files that were segregated away in in the chancellery basement from the regular priest files. You know, I mean, we we have struggled for so long to even look at what's going on, and how can we expect that now we'd be able to just create a solution overnight? You mentioned sort of these books where you are, you know, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Twin Cities, and with all of these records, and we know that that same story has happened in many other dioceses, not only in the United States, but right around the world and in different countries, different places. There is this sense as well, Chris, and I'd like you to give me your viewpoint on it, that, you know, this is a very almost secret society, that the Catholic Church sees itself as a law unto itself, uh, which is perhaps able to exist outside of the laws that the rest of us follow. Is there any truth to that? You know, so I will say that the church globally is a very large and complex institution run by pretty diverse individuals. I do think that for a number of bishops and a lot of the clergy, and certainly even a lot of Catholic laity, that is the case. Yes, um, this idea of kind of the, a perfect institution uh, instituted by God, protected from kind of typical human problems. Uh, and, I mean, we have to recognize that that's just not true. We know they are at a crossroads with this summit, and it will be a real test of Pope Francis's leadership six years since he became Pope. What are you going to be watching for, uh, Chris? I do think that we will see concrete changes, but I'm skeptical that we'll see this problem resolved overnight. You know, this is not just an issue of the bishops, but it's also an issue of Catholic culture. 
How do the people in the pews relate to the clergy? What do we accept from the chancelleries? How do we ourselves talk about sexual violence and the sexual abuse of children? Are we willing to educate ourselves on these issues, or are we going to fall on kind of like old stereotypes or tropes that protect us from the reality of what's going on? All right, let me ask you as well about this book, which is really quite fascinating, by French author Frederick Martel, journalist. The book is called In the Closet of the Vatican, Power, Homosexuality, Hypocrisy. And Chris, I had the opportunity to interview Frederick Martel on the television show that I do up here in Canada, the news program I do. And what's interesting is he said, you know, I spent a long time working on this book, and I myself am a gay man, and this wasn't about trying to sort of, you know, point fingers or, or out people, but it just struck him that there was a certain amount of hypocrisy in the Catholic Church, that it was basically controlled by gay men at the highest levels, and yet there was this condemnation of homosexuality, uh, and some of the more conservative bishops uh, were trying to confuse and conflate the issue of sexual abuse by the Catholic Church with homosexuality. Now, you are a Catholic, you are a gay man, you've written about this. What do you think about this book? You know, I haven't read it yet. I will say that uh, at this point, it did not surprise me. You know, I personally know someone who was basically seduced by an individual working in the cat in the Vatican. You know, I know a number of gay priests. I've had a number of gay priests reach out to me because of my writing. You know, I think that it's foolish for us to assume that the number or percentage of gay priests is small. Um, you know, I I do think that individuals who try to blame the abuse crisis on homosexuality just are not paying attention to the research. And frankly, I don't think they really care about the research. I don't think anything can be said to change their mind. Um, but I do think, I think that the issues can be related in this way. So if an individual is extremely deluded about their own sexual orientation or about their feelings and attractions, and they fight to do what they can to destroy that or reject that within themselves, it would make sense to me that that would affect the way that they approach ministry and the way that they approach the church as an institution. To me, that would certainly create blind spots in the ways that you're going to address issues that might implicate sexuality. And if you have a hatred for your own sexuality, then certainly you're going to try to, to bring that out in other areas of, as well. So I don't think it's surprising that we see a number of priests and bishops trying to blame this issue on homosexuality, and I wouldn't be surprised that if a number of them were gay. You raise such a great point. Sometimes those who are the most homophobic are those who themselves are closeted, and it's a way for them to run from themselves by pointing the figure elsewhere. What about the notion of, of the hypocrisy here? So if the Catholic Church under this pope, for example, trying to move in a more quote-unquote progressive way, the pope himself was one who said, who am I to judge when talking about gay people, and yet you then have bishops around him, power brokers around him at the Vatican who themselves are gay and pushing back back at his reforms, and there's a backlash against this pope. We know that is also playing out these days at the Vatican. What do you make of that? Is that hypocrisy? Uh, I mean, I think it certainly can be. You know, I, I think, and I say this as a Catholic, I think that every Catholic has to deal with the ways in which we've been hypocrites in addressing these issues, in addressing the reforms that need to come. You know, I, when these issues first came out in my own archdiocese at the time, I was kind of a very zealous young Catholic, and I defended Archbishop Ninestead. I had thought that the whistleblower was just someone who was angry at the archdiocese, and I failed to really appreciate the, the magnitude of these issues. And now I think that we, every Catholic needs to take an accounting of themselves. In, in thinking through the ways in which we personally might be culpable or might have um, helped to kind of prevent the church from addressing these problems. Chris, I'd love to have you back down the line to talk more. Wonderful conversation. Yeah, thank you. Chris Damien was my guest. He was joining us from St. Paul in Minnesota. He's a writer and a speaker and a lawyer. He's written two books on what it means to be gay and Catholic. We're going to be right back on the program. Stay with us.